If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24. And I'd like to talk to you tonight about do the right thing. Do the right thing. And you know, we truly live in a world uh, where people are not doing the right thing. Uh, I look around and the way people treat each other and the way sometimes even businesses are run and uh, just, you know, things in general. Uh, I remember the day when my father or even my grandfather, uh, they would make deals on lands or they would buy something and uh, they would just do it with a handshake. You know, there wasn't any contracts. There wasn't, you know, any of that going on. And uh, it was a thing of where, uh, you know, your word was your bond. And when people told you something, uh, they, they followed through with it. Uh, but today, uh, I want to share with you about uh, David. And, uh, and I understand, you know, David messed up big time. Uh, uh, but still, uh, in this instance of what was going on here, uh, he really uh, did the right thing. And I just, you know, as, as Christians, we need to do the right thing. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. It uh, doesn't matter what everybody else's opinion is. Uh, we need to set the example. And really, we need to set the bar high. We really do. Because, I mean, folks, the bar is Jesus Christ. Uh, he is our example. Uh, and the Bible was written so that we could, you know, see these examples and, and understand that, you know, David and these folks uh, were, were humans, just human beings, just like us. And, uh, you know, everybody struggles. Uh, there's going to be temptations in life, uh, but we need to do the right thing. Uh, the outline, number one, and these are short, the temptation. The temptation. Satan is alive. He is going to tempt you. He's going to be in your face. He's going to hit you at your weakest moment. Uh, he's going to uh, just put enticing things in front of you. Number two, the conviction. I thank God for conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need that in our lives. Uh, the Word of God is our plumb line. It is our biblical instructions. But without conviction, we will not do the right thing. So uh, we need that in our lives. And number two, three, the decision. And there comes a time where you're going to have to decide, okay, am I going to do the right thing or not? And uh, these, these, I believe, are important things in our lives. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, and we know where we are in Scripture. Uh, Saul uh, disobeyed God. Uh, King Saul, uh, you know, he went up against the Amorites, and God told him to wipe them out, you know, just destroy them, don't bring back any of their stuff. Uh, and he uh, did not do that. He disobeyed it, tried to blame it on someone else. Uh, but God said, I am taking the kingdom from you. And from that point on, uh, he had David in mind. And we know the story of David, you know, uh, son of Jesse. And, you know, he, they were looking at his sons, you know, and uh, Nathan uh, later on talked to him. But I'm, I'm simply saying, you know, David was next in line and uh, God was preparing him for that. And, and uh, Saul found out about that. And we know Saul and Jonathan, uh, I'm, no, excuse me, David and Jonathan uh, got to be best friends. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Jonathan was protecting David. Uh, three times Saul tried to kill David. You know, he was out there hurling, you know, spears at him uh, because of jealousy. And then just, uh, I believe it was the 18th or 19th chapter uh, where they, you know, David came back from battle and they, you know, they had this chant going, you know, Saul killed thousands and, you know, and, and David killed ten thousands. Of the enemy, so David had gotten really popular uh, in the eyes of the Israelites, and uh, that kind of put a target on David's back. And so David was basically running from Saul, uh, not wanting to do battle with him, not wanting to fight with his men. Uh, but Saul had made it a point. All right, I'm I'm going to take David out. So that's where we are. So let's look at the temptation. Now it happened when Saul had returned from the fo following the Philistines. Then it was told of him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness 
of En Gedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel. Uh, you got that many folks, that's serious business, okay? You're hunting him down, you're looking at him, you're splitting these teams of folks up, and you're combing the hills, you're combing uh, the land and the caves and everything else, looking for David. And went to seek David and his men uh, on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went to attend his knees, and David's men were staying in the recesses of these caves, unbeknowing of Saul, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, Saul had no idea that they were in uh, uh, the caves, the very cave uh, that he was, went into. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day which the Lord has said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do uh, good do to him as it seems good to you. And here's the temptation. Notice what these friends say, okay? Today is the day which the Lord said, all right? And folks, I'm just telling you, there are good people that will give you their own opinion, but not necessarily God's advice, okay? And, and so, uh, they thought, and, and even they said that, here's an opportunity. God made this happen, okay? So you need to take advantage of that. You've been running. He's tried to kill you three times, and they were in the cave just trying to convince David that this is what he needed to do. And it says, and David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And David immediately, you know, the temptation was there, folks, but he realized that that is not what he, wanted, what he needed to do. But he did do something, okay? And I'll address that here in just a few minutes. Uh, he wanted to send Saul a message, all right, that, hey, I could have done this, but I didn't do that. Uh, hold your finger there and go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Blessed, okay? James 1, verse 12. And blessed means happy. Okay, happy is the man who endures temptation. Men, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of temptation out there. We, as leaders of our homes, all right, we need to be on guard against temptations. I mean, there are more, you know, and even in, you think about, you know, what our kids face today compared to what we faced when we were in school. I mean, it's just unbelievable all that's going on there. All right, but happy is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And again, when the Lord makes a promise, folks, uh, it will always come true. And basically, the w Lord was just saying, uh, hey, if you will think about it, if you will pray about it, uh, if you will say no to temptation, you will win victory over that. And it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God is not tripping you up. God is not giving you. He would not give you good, uh, good advice. He would not lie to you. He would not put temptation in front of you. We know who does that, folks. It's Satan. Satan is the tempter. Satan is the deceiver. Satan wants us to fall. Satan wants us to uh, be weak, all right? And it says God is not that way. In verse 15, uh, but no, verse 14, but uh, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And here's the deal, folks. When you are tempted, you don't need to dwell on it. You need to say no as fast as you can and move on. See, that's what I think happened to Eve, okay? When you start a conversation with the devil and, and you know, you do this, I'm telling you, he's sneaky, uh, he misquotes the Word of God. And also, you, you need to understand not just misquoting the Word of God, but misinterpreting the Word of God. People can misinterpret the Word of God and, and send you down the wrong road. What do we have? We have the Holy Spirit, okay? So when that temptation comes, you need to react immediately. And sometimes, folks, I just talk to myself. I just talk out loud. I just say, hey, I, devil, I know it's you. 
I don't like you. I'm not going to do that. Get out of my life and, and, and move on, okay? Verse 15, then when the desire is conceived, it bursts to sin and, uh, and it bursts to sin and sin, when it's full grown, brings death. And again, disobeying God can bring death. All right, First John says it, there is a sin unto death. But what he is talking about, he's talking about, it, it's like when you uh, burn a place, you know, you, you, you get that scar tissue going, and you could burn that two or three times, and pretty soon there's no feeling in that place. And folks, I'm telling you, we're going down a dangerous road when we don't have the feeling of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a dangerous road to be on. At verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights. What is he saying? Folks, another scripture uh, is God always gives us a way out. He doesn't leave us hanging, okay? He gives us an opportunity to say no to temptation if we will listen to the Holy Spirit and do the right thing. And it comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of his turning. And you know what some people think? They think they're the exception to the rule. Now, the Bible, uh, you know, it applies to everyone. If it's in the Bible, then we need to do it. Okay? But, you know, I hear this all the time. I would, I would do this, but, and you can fill in the blanks, folks. It's black and white. What does he say here? Light. Who's light? It's Jesus. Who is darkness? It's Satan. So the choice is already made. I mean, it's clear. You know, these people that said, say that, you know, I, I really didn't know I was sinning. Well, folks, the conviction of the Holy, Holy Spirit should tell you that you're sinning, all right? No variation of his own turning, of his own will, he brought forth us by the word of truth that we may be the kind of first truth of his scripture. So what is the word of truth? It's the word of God. Folks, what does the Word of God say about it? And if God says it's wrong, folks, it's wrong. I mean, you look at, you know, David and look at Saul here. I mean, he, he would break the, one of the Ten Commandments if he took his life, okay? I mean, thou shalt not murder. And so he did the right thing. The temptation, the conviction. Look at the conviction. Now, it happened afterwards, uh, verse 5. David's heart troubled him because he had cut off Saul's rope. And here's the point in this. There are some people that are not as sensitive to sin as others. Okay? What may not be sin to me could be sin to someone else. But I'm just telling you, you know, I'm trying to think of how to, how to say this. I'm just, I'm just saying there are Christians that truly believe they're not sinning when they are sinning, okay? Because the Bible is clear about that. So you can't say or you can't justify what somebody else is doing. These guys, his buddy said, kill him, okay? God gave you the opportunity. You take his life. But David was convicted about just cutting his rope. Why? In his mind and in his heart, I believe he thought, he, he thought, well, he's king. And folks, the Bible is clear on the rulers of the land. I don't have to vote for a certain ruler, but I still need to respect the office. And David realized he should not have cut his robe, okay? And, and David's heart. Folks, the word is conviction. He got under conviction over that, where most people would think he didn't do anything wrong. Okay? Well, folks, if God convicts you of something, it's wrong. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. All right? And it says, and he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he's anointed of the Lord. The Lord did anoint him. The Lord did take his kingdom from him. But the Lord had not put David in office yet. So he was still, notice what he called him, his master. Was he deserving to be his master? Probably not. Had he been going, kind of losing it mentally? Yes. But still, he disrespected uh, the office. 
So David restrained his servants with these words and did not arise, and allow them to arise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. And folks, there's two kinds of guilt. And we need discernment in, this, this, in these two instances. There's true guilt and there's false guilt. Okay? True guilt is conviction of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and that's, that's why when, when I look at conviction, I look at two things. Number one, I look, what does the Word of God say? And the second thing I look at, what is the Holy Spirit saying? And so I look at those two things, and false guilt is Satan messing with you and messing with your head. And I, I, I've done this, I've done this several times. I will sin, and I will do something wrong, and I mean immediately I ask God to forgive me of that sin. I mean it, okay? And you can go over to him talking to the disciples. Hey, if somebody sins against you, how many times do you need to forgive them? Well, seven times, 70, 490 times. Are we keeping the count and then, then you're not forgiven? No. Well, what was he saying? If someone truly asks for forgiveness, because folks, that's exactly what God does for us. We sin. Sometimes we sin every day. But yet, there is forgiveness in that. And false guilt is Satan throwing these things back in your face and you having to deal with it over and over again. You know when a lot of that happens? You know when this false guilt comes in a lot of times? It comes, it comes at night. Think about that. What, what is night? It is darkness. And Satan is trying to steal your sleep. Satan is trying to mess with you. Okay? Because you have been forgiven. And if you truly have been forgiven, then folks, God forgives you of that and you need to move on. Satan wants you to live there, but, it, but, but we don't need to do that. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. This is David. Uh, basically, uh, you know, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet had came. And, and basically, uh, you know, when he called him out on, on Uriah the Hittite and had him killed and, ha and committed adultery with Bathsheba, uh, he had came to him and called him out. And he basically said, David, and he gave the story of the lamb and, and you know, uh, killing that lamb. And he said, David, you are the man. You are the one that has done that. See, David had just pushed it out of the way. Uh, it was some eight or nine months later when it was dealt, he dealt with it. And he cries out, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Folks, we all need the mercy of God in our lives. There's no one sinless in this building, okay? We sin, and, and nobody's perfect, you know? And, and again, I'm not trying to, you know, make sin easy or anything like that, but we all make wrong choices. We all sin, and it's only God's loving kindness, that, that unconditional love that he deals with us with. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, and we know the mercy of God is given us, not given us what we deserve, folks, all right? And then he says, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. One of the illustrations that I remember that uh, we did uh, when I was a youth minister is I did a devotion one night at Falls Creek, and I had a cross, and it, it wasn't a huge cross. Uh, we could actually set it on a table and, and, you know, reach up and, uh, you know, touch it like up here. But what I did was I talked about the importance of, of giving, uh, you, know, you know, confessing your sin and giving, the, you know, giving that over to God. And what I asked the kids to do that night uh, was take a piece of paper and write, write the sin that was in their life at that present time. And we put you know, that sin on the cross. And I'm telling you, that night, you talk about, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know how many rededications there were. I mean, we, we always took over 100 kids to camp, but I would say probably half of them. You know, and what I did, I said, I want you to go and you put that on there and I want you to stay around that cross till you've asked forgiveness of that sin. And you could literally hear kids 
crying that night. Okay? And folks, that's what true conviction does. True conviction should break our hearts. I remember when I was a kid at Cameron Baptist Church, I'm just telling you, there were some revivals where there were people at the altar, and I'm not talking about crying. They were wailing. Okay? They were wailing. And we would have invitations that would last 20, 25 minutes. And, and you know, it, it was just people getting right with God. Folks, it is so, so important that we don't pass off conviction. And I think one of the reasons we don't come to the altar is that we are, we are afraid of what people would think of us. Folks, I mean, it's not that I don't care what people think of me, but if God's dealing with me personally, all right, then I just need to do what God says, all right? And if that causes much grief for me or, you know, something for me, then so be it, folks. And I believe in this particular spot, I'm telling you, David had come face to face. David was tired of running from God. David was under heavy conviction. I mean, you think of all that he went through through with his daughter and his sons. And he was just tired of running from God. And he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me, from my sin. cleanse me from my sin. Now here's the key, for I acknowledge my sin. See what some people get upset at, they get upset because they got caught in their sin. And folks, there's a huge difference between conviction of your sins and caught in your sin. Caught in is you feel like you have to confess it or you have to do this. Where I'm telling you, the, the cleansing part is you, you, you have to cry out to God. You have to make things right. I acknowledge my transgression, confession, and my sin is always before me against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And folks, I believe this. You know, I, I do believe in public sin and private sin. I do believe if I've sinned publicly, then I need to apologize publicly. But most of our sin is private. And we need to confess that to God. Folks, he already knows it. He already knows it. And so David had a change of heart. So we see the temptation. We see the conviction. And let's see the decision. And David arose afterward, verse 8 and went out of the cave and called to Saul and said, My Lord, the King. I mean, he didn't get up there and say, Hey, I let you live. Why do you keep chasing me? I could have killed you. He could have disrespected Saul, but he didn't. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. Notice he was still, in, still even though Saul was wrong, he was showing respect. He was doing the right thing. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say to you, indeed, David seeks you to harm. Look, this day your eyes have seen the Lord, and, and, and Lord delivered you today into uh, uh, my hands in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe, I did not kill you. Know and see that there is no evil, no rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. And again, you, you, know, you can interpret that two ways, you know, that he really didn't do anything wrong, but, he, but in his mind, in, in David's mind, he, he did. He, he, he felt bad about what he did. You, you'll see that as we go down through here. And yet you hunt my life to take it, and let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. And he's basically saying, I, I, had, I, I, had, I had you there. I could have, but God told me not to. As the proverb of the ancient says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, and he's quoting Pro, Proverbs 24, 13 there, but my hand shall not be against you, after whom has the king of Israel come out. Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? Therefore let the Lord judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my, my case and deliver me out of your hand. And basically he was saying, hey, 
I want to do the right thing. I want to do what God tells me to do. All right? I mean, you know, you, you try to take his life three times, then you chase him around uh, with 3,000 soldiers. Okay? I mean, David would just say, I could have, but I didn't. Verse 16, so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son? And again, he, at first when Jonathan and David, you know, he, he counted him as a son. And David played the harp. David played a musical instrument. Why? Because David had already, I mean, uh, uh, Saul had already done some wrong things and he had trouble sleeping. And, and folks, that tells me a lot about music, folks. M music is ministry to your soul. Music is soothing. And, and I'm just telling you, through all my sickness, I, I, I just, man, I, I put my headphones on, I listen to K-Love, or I, there's basically three Christian stations I listen to. And, and even with the prednisone and all, you know, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep for about an hour, you know, and man, I'll have that on. And, and you just go back to sleep because of the music. And, 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 and uh, you know, Saul had such, I, I mean, demons were chasing him. Uh, you just read all that he had went through. Uh, but David had mercy on him. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, where I, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. Folks, we know the golden rule. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And folks, just because somebody does you wrong does not mean you have the right to do them wrong. See, we need to do the right thing. I mean, all areas of our life, all areas, whether it's our finances, whether it's relationships, whether it's business deals, uh, whether it's our, our word, we need to do the right thing. Verse 18, and you have shown me this day how you have dealt with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hands, you did not kill me. For a man finds his enemy, for if a man finds his enemy, he will let, will he let him get away safely? And even Saul would just say, you know, most people would have done that. Most people would have said, hey, he tried to kill me, so I need to get rid of him. That way I don't have to worry about him and his soldiers anymore. Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Him doing the right thing was even a testimony to the man that tried to kill him. Folks, that's, that, that means a lot. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and the kingdom of Israel shall establish you in your hand. And he didn't want to give up kingship, but he is coming to the place in his life and this, this uh, incident that happened made him realize that, you know, I could have been killed today. I could have easily been killed today. It is obvious that God wants David to be king of Israel. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. And David made that. David swore to Saul. And Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. You know, David kept his word even at that. After Saul had died, and we all know, you know, what happened in battle and all that happened. Uh, you know, he wanted to find out if there was any of Saul's kin left. And uh, Meshavah, <laughs> anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, he came to the king's table. Uh, he treated him, crippled guy, crippled relative of, of Saul's, and he took wonderful care of him. First Timothy 4, and I close with this. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example. Folks, we need to be an example to other, thing, other people around us. We need to do the right thing, and when we do the right thing and somebody asks us, we need to tell them why we did the right thing. Because they'll ask you, why didn't you get mad? Why didn't you get even? Why didn't you? And I'm telling you, that just throws you into a personal testimony. Because I'm a Christian, because my Bible tells me not to do that, because I may want to see this person saved. 
you can, you can go many a way off of a question like that. Be an example to the believers, and not just the believers, okay? I'm not trying to change the Bible. Folks, we need to be example to everybody. People are watching us everywhere we go, everywhere we go. And I, I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm bad, as bad about this too. I truly believe we sin with our mouths more than we sin with any other you know, any, any other sin that we have in our lives. You know, there's times where we just don't need to say anything, but yet we say it, and, and I'm guilty of that too. In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Folks, people need to know that we are Christians. And people need to know that we are going to do the right thing. Father, thank you for this night. and. God, I just thank you for this Old Testament example. And Lord, I just thank you that uh, we can draw from examples like this. And God, you know, it's easy to make excuses and it's easy to justify why we do some things. But God, your word is true. It is clear. Uh, it, is, it is unchanging. That's what the, the variation, you know, it, it, it doesn't change. Matter of fact, Hebrews tells us your word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So God, I pray that in every situation of our lives, we'll do the right thing. Doesn't matter what the reaction to other people are. Doesn't matter what other people say or think. God, I pray that we would please you, that we would follow your word, and that we would do the right thing every time. God, Jesus is our example. Jesus is uh, you know, uh, one we should em emulate. And God, we need to follow him, you know, and just the, the same, I want to be like Jesus, uh, should just permeate uh, in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds. So God, as we even leave this place, we're going to have a chance between now and Sunday to be good examples. And we have a chance to do the right thing. God, I pray we would always do that. And we would use it as a testimony for you, for you and what you've done in our personal lives. So God, thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that we would say no to temptation and yes to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.